Now the topic is uh, the freedom struggle of Tibetan people continues despite suppression by China. Absolutely, for five reasons. Number one, the great 14th Dalai Lama and his vision. Number two, spirit, solidarity and resilience of Tibetans in Tibet. Number three, exile Tibetans, democratization of government exile. Number four, India and its people, their generosity has helped us survive and sustain and strengthen our movement. Number five, international community, especially friends of support all over the world and also particularly in the West, in America and European countries for supporting us for all these years. So these are the five reasons why Tibetan freedom struggle is alive, kicking and strong. Now let me elaborate one by one. As far as, you know, His Holiness, the great 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet, as we all know, he was born in a poor, uh, you know, farmer's family in Amdo. And from there, he was enthroned at the age of 16 when the invasion of, you know, the Chinese army was imminent. All the adults gave the authority to 16-year-old boy, His Holiness Dalai Lama, to take on the leadership, to deal with the crisis. And he did the best he could uh, to encourage people, inspire Tibetans in Tibet, went to China in 1954, spent 11 months there, talked to Mao Zedong, talked to Chao Enlai, the Prime Minister, and Chu Te, to convince them to be more lenient on Tibetans, to uh, you know, introduce reform after consulting and seeking approval of the Tibetan people, which they all agreed. A 17-point agreement was signed on that, which was undersigned under the rest, but that was the crux of the understanding. But, um, Communist Party of China turned out to be very conniving. Uh, they betrayed all the hopes and the trust of the Tibetan people. Finally, Tibet was invaded, illegally occupied, and brutally suppressed, which forced His Holiness the Dalai Lama and 80,000 Tibetans to come to India. After coming to India, again, 23 or 4 years old Dalai Lama, you know, let Tibetan people encourage them in refugee camps. We had nothing. But single-handedly, he visited all the refugee camps. He visited all the schools, rebuilt monasteries. So all the major monasteries destroyed in Tibet was rebuilt in India. Our Buddhist civilization was re revived in India thanks to the vision and leadership of great 14th Dalai Lama. Number two, the spirit, solidarity, and resilience of Tibetans inside Tibet. I mean, when Chinese army came, more than a million Tibetans perish um, because of war, uh, you know, persecution, uh, in prison, and of hunger, all kinds of reasons, you know. Um, but the spirit continued, right? Resilience. Continue. Even today, six million Tibetans in Tibet are fighting for the cause. They are protests, you know, silently, publicly, vocally. And we all know fact uh, that 157 or 8 Tibetans have committed self-immolation. They have burned themselves, you know, a um, few uh, of them just last year. Uh, that shows how desperate Tibetans are, but also how determined Tibetans are, that they want to say, we will sacrifice ourselves, but we will fight for a cause. And that our aspirations to see the return of His Holiness Dalai Lama to Tibet and freedom, basic freedom for Tibetans must be provided by the Chinese government and supported by the international community. So. Tibetan spirit is very strong inside him. Just listen to some of the singers in Tibet. They're you know, singing songs in praise uh, uh, of their identity, how proud of their culture, language, you know. So Tibetans from all walks of life, whether they're nomads, farmers, you know, um, intellectuals, even the Communist Party members, right? But their heart and their mind is with the Tibetan people and Tibet as a nation. So 
That's number two, why our freedom struggle continues even today. Number three, exiled Tibetans and the democratization of his uh, uh, Tibetan government exile or Tibetan community, right? His has gifted us democracy, exiled Tibetans embraced it. We rebuilt uh, all the major monasteries, as I said, and rebuilt and built rather uh, settlements, uh, schools, monasteries. Now, Tibetan government exile is the most well-run government exile, you know, by none. There are around 100 million refugees uh, and people in diaspora, but among all of them, the most organized administration exile is the Central Tibetan administration. So we all should be very proud of it. It is democratic, right? And it's functioning and it delivers. We run our own schools, we run our own hospitals, we run our own bank, we run our own semi embassies all over the world. And, and, and then, you know, uh, the uh, Tibetan communities uh, and the organizations all over the world are well connected and, you know, integrated very, very well. So exiled Tibetans have played major role and now the younger generation who are getting better, better education, better exposure will provide far, far, far better leadership for uh, the Tibetan freedom movement. So that's number three. Number four is India and its people. Without the generosity of India and its people and its great leader in 1950s, 60s, who uh, provided us shelter and made us not just survive, but sustain and strengthen. So that's the reason why we are strong today. Now, lately, uh, even in India, there is a realization that, you know, uh, perhaps uh, PRC, especially the Communist Party of China, uh, may not be trusted uh, because of the repeated incursions in the border area, hostile actions from Doklam in 1915, uh, 2015 in Sikkim, Bhutan and uh, area and Galwan Valley in the May, June of uh, 2020 in Ladakh and recently in Arunachal Pradesh, just a few months ago, the incursions and the, f in the fist fights uh, between Indian and uh, Chinese troops, which Indian troops pushed them back, clearly indicate um, that uh, the PLA soldiers are a bit hostile and aggressive uh, towards Indian side and the sovereignty of India is under challenge. Now, why I say this is great realization because historically there was never a land border between India and China. It was always a border between India and Tibet. 3,000 miles long border, 2,000 plus, it was with India in Tibet. In fact, when Tibet was invaded, the finance ministry of Tibet Shagawa wrote Indian Prime Minister saying, help us. If you help us now, it will help you too. Because presently we have barely 80 or so uh, soldiers guarding 3,000 mile long border, right? If you don't help us now, India will pay a heavy price and it has become a reality. Now, if you look at the border, not 80, not 8,000, not 80,000, but hundreds of thousands of Indian soldiers in this cold weather are guarding the border areas of India because the Chinese troops have come to the other side. So India has paid the heaviest price. And also, this remains a major challenge because, you know, uh, in Asia, as Asia prosper, as Asia becomes rich and powerful, the tensions and conflicts are bound to happen. And Indochina conflict is much talked about, but actually historically there was no Indochina border. It was always between India and Tibet. So Tibet is the reason, Tibet is the buffer zone, Tibet is the land, which is the source cause or the reason for the conflict if it happens in the future. So without understanding the Tibet issue, you will never understand Indochina land border issue. So very important. And also Tibet is a source of major rivers of Asia, right? You just name it, in the Philippines in South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and in, in the major rivers of Southeast Asia, Mekong, Irrawaddy, Salwin, all flow from Tibet. 
hundreds of millions of people in Southeast Asia are dependent on these rivers. And the source of these rivers is Tibet. Brahmaputra for northeast of India and Bangladesh, again, originates in Tibet. Satlash River and Indus River, which is a lifeline both for India, particularly Kashmir area and Pakistan, both flow from Tibet. Even for China, right? The um, Yangtze River and Yellow River both originate in, in Tibet. And even the Chinese environmentalists are saying, we must protect the Tibetan plateau for the sake of Chinese people. That is the source of our water. 1.4 billion people in Asia are dependent on water flowing from Tibet. So even the Chinese environmentalists are coming out and saying, we must declare Tibet as a national reserve you know, or natu a national park to protect it for our own sake. And Tibet is a source of you know, many, many minerals. You just name it, uh, uranium, gold, copper, lithium. Uh, obviously, we all know Xinjiang has you know, iron and petrol. And Inner Mongolia has, you know, 90% um, uh, of rare earth of China comes from Inner Mongolia, so on and so forth. So very, very important. And now India has, India is realizing, in fact, the whole of Asia is realizing how important Tibet is. So that's the, the reason number four. Number five is international community. Friends of Tibet all over the world, right? Buddhist centers all over the world. They've been the foot soldiers who carried the Tibetan struggle, carried our flag in the streets and the corners of various capitals and various cities and towns and villages that kept the Tibetan freedom struggle alive for all these years, for which we are very grateful. And, uh, uh, and particularly in the Western countries, right? America uh, being in the forefront, European countries, also recently in Japan, you know, now Japan has the largest parliamentary support group in the whole world, right? Recently, they formed a coalition caucus of Tibetan, Mongolian, and Uyghur uh, people uh, of human rights violation. And there is, uh, you know, caucus where more than 100 par Japanese parliamentarians have joined uh, and, and, and be part of it. And they passed resolution also in the parliament condemning human rights violations of Uyghur Tibetans and Mongolians. So these are all thanks to the support of international community, why the Tibetan uh, cause is still alive. And to, uh, as far as the United States is concerned, in 2020, they passed Tibetan Policy and Support Act 2020. Now, it's a law in the U.S. to support Tibet. And then there are several resolutions have been passed in the Czech Republic and few you know, uh, European countries as well. So international community have played vital role in supporting the cause of Tibet. So, number one, His Holiness, the Great Fourteen Dalai Lama of Tibet. Number two, Tibetans inside Tibet, six million of them, solid, strong. Number three, exiled Tibetans. Number four, India and Indian people. Number five, international community and international governments. You know, these five fingers, united as one, had sustained the Tibetan freedom struggle, for which we are very, very grateful. And we urge people in Philippines and Southeast Asia, revive that same spirit for justice, which you led in 1959, 61, 65, at the United Nations, at the UN General Assembly, where Malaysia, Thailand, you know, and uh, 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 Philippines were in the forefront, um, supporting the cause of Tibet, uh, please, Continue to have this kind of debate and uh, be with us till, you know, basic freedom of Tibetan people is realized and His Holiness Dalai Lama return to Tibet. Till then, um, and I would like to again uh, thank uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies for organizing this conference and all the participants, and you have very impressive list of speakers. And I have just summarized in you know, five key points as to why Tibetan freedom struggle continues despite this, uh, despite suppression uh, by China. And uh, the you know impressive speakers will elaborate on these five points and many other you know uh, comprehensive issues to make this uh, conference a very successful 
informative educational uh, event. Thank you very much. That's the link to this chain.